Welcome to the Model Health Show. This is fitness and nutrition expert Sean Stevenson here with my beautiful co-host and producer Jade Harrell. What's up, Jade? What's up, Sean? How are you today? Well, today I'm paleogasmic. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. It's a true word. Uh-oh. It's an official word. Paleo I have been binge watching and consuming uh, Paleo Kitchen with Camille. Camille's Paleo Kitchen, Camille Macris. Mm-hmm. And I am just all there, Paleo Gasmic. Paleo Gasmic. That's deep. I <laughs> like it. It's her term, and I have to say <laughs> it's good. I like it. Awesome. <laughs> well, everybody, thank Great you so stuff. much for tuning into the show today. We've got a fantastic mm-hmm. episode lined up for you guys. We've got a great guest. And, you know, today we're going to talk about training. We're going to talk about exercise. We're going to talk about all manners of geekery, you know, because we've got the man, the myth, the legend, Ben Greenfield on the show today. And pretty much if you don't know about Ben, he's by far one of the top uh, fitness and nutrition experts out there in the interwebs. But he's basically kind of like a compilation of all Mark Wahlberg movies kind of put together. He's doing like fighting stuff, like obstacle courses, sniper stuff. (laughs) You know, just like, and even the really um, out of the blue comedy as mm-hmm. well. You know, mm-hmm. like when Mark st- started in the movie with, uh, was it Will Ferrell? Uh huh. Was the other guys, <laughs> right? right? Say hi to your mother for fun. me. Right. Right. <laughs> and, um, but also just really on the cutting edge of stuff, transformer <laughs> level stuff. Yeah. Hey guys, I just found a transformer. <laughs> you know, so it's going to be really awesome. He's got some great stuff to share. But first, let's give a huge shout out to our oh, show sponsor, onit.com. Head over to onnit.com forward slash model and you're going to get 10% off all of your health and human performance supplements. You should already know we're huge fans of the Shroom Tech Immune, Shroom Tech Sport. Uh, The Shroom Tech Immune is based on chaga mushroom, which clinically shown to have a 300% increase in your NK cells activity. And I like to think of your NK cells as kind of like coaches or trainers for your immune system. Basically helping your immune system to modulate and to create immunological weapons against any kind of weirdness you might be exposed to. Right. You know, right. something really valuable there. The Shroom Tech Sport is more of a pre-workout type of supplement or pre-life, <laughs> you know, if you got a lot to right. do, based on cordyceps mushroom, with all, which also has about 120% increase in your NK cell, cell activity. But more so, this has been clinically shown to improve the oxygenation of your blood and improve insulin sensitivity. Cool stuff like that. Yes. And it's just good. It's good stuff. It's It's great stuff to just keep. It's in my bag over there. Mm -hmm. My trusty man bag. (laughs) Not a man purse, not a purse, but a man. It's a messenger bag. Okay. Got it it for my birthday. It works. So I carry this stuff around me all the time. Really, really love these guys. They've been a huge supporter of the show. And head over there and check them out. Support yourself, support your health, and get on it. Yes. All right. O N N I T (laughs) dot com forward slash model for 10% off. Now let's get into the iTunes review of the week. Well, this one is from I am prepared to win. Gave us five stars. This is a public service announcement. Okay. So I don't usually write reviews, but this is more of a warning and public service announcement. I just feel the need to share my true thoughts based on my experience listening to the model health show for a few months now. Like me, many potential listeners read a few comments before making the decision to subscribe or listen to a podcast. I wish someone had given me a heads up. First, if you listen to this podcast, you might find yourself walking down a grocery aisle and passing right by your favorite potato chips and wondering, what kind of Jedi mind trick caused me to do that (laughs) as you pursue the non-GMO blueberries? Second, you might find later friends, you might find friends and family smiling when they ask, how are you today? And you respond with something like, I'm phenomenal, phenomenal with joy, inspired by the awesome Jade Neri, the Jade Motivational Dictionary. Third, you might even find yourself making your bedroom a little darker, going to sleep at 9 p.m. for optimal rest and ending your shower with a super cold water the next morning only to realize that you are now some kind of energy-laden and longevity-seeking version of your former self. I have so much more to I have so much more to say, but I think I've said enough because much of this will not make any sense until you go back and listen to all of the episodes, which you definitely should do, perhaps while walking, washing dishes, or on your way to work. Why not maximize your idle time? If you're thinking about subscribing to the Model Health Show podcast, you clearly should do this. While while I don't know you, Sean or Jade personally, I am confident that you will find yourself smiling when a new episode of the show flashes across your screen because you know that listening helps you become a better person in more ways than one. Who doesn't want that? Enjoy the show filled with gratitude, Victoria. P.S. 
Thanks, Sean and Jade, for your contributions to the world. I respect, value, and have great appreciation for both of you. You're a great team. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm just taking that all in. That, that was, was so phenomenal. Yeah. And I Thank love Thank you for every that. single Wasn't word. Yes. Yeah. Chips pass by you right, must. what happened? <laughs> she said Jedi mind trick right. on the chips. I, I love pass it. Pass by you must. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. That means the world oh, to me. Oh, my gosh. Me too. Yeah. Totally appreciate that. <laughs> Everybody, thanks for leaving those reviews over on iTunes. Now let's go ahead and get into our show and our special guest. Our guest today is Ben Greenfield. He is an ex-bodybuilder, Ironman triathlete, Spartan racer, coach, wow. speaker, and author of the New York Times bestseller, Beyond Training, Mastering Endurance, Health, and Life. In 2008, Ben was voted as NSCA's Personal Trainer of the Year. Hey. The Man of the Year. <laughs> and in 2013 and 2014, was named by Greatest as one of the top 100 most influential people in health and fitness. Ben blogs and podcasts at bengreenfieldfitness.com. And he resides in Spokane, Washington with his wife and his twin boys. And I'd like to welcome mm, to the boys. Model Health Show, Mr. Ben Greenfield. How you doing today, man? Good. I, can I say three quick things? <laughs> Bring it on, bro. Prom well, two quick things, one <laughs> slightly longer thing. One, I'm not a sniper. I just want to clear that up. I, I do I do shoot with the bow, but I don't do the whole like mile long uh, Chris Kyle style American whatever the name of that movie oh, was it? sniper stuff. American so I just sniper. just want to make sure people know I'm not a I'm not doing much sniping. Um, second, that person uh, should write the next Charles Dickens novel because that was a freaking long review, um, but it was good. And then third, Chaga. Um, I didn't tell you about this, Sean, but I was over in uh, Finland a couple of weeks ago and I found a giant chunk of Chaga growing on a tree in the forest when yeah. I was foraging. First tree. And I, I hacked off a bunch of it with a with a pocket knife and brought it back here with me and I just got done doing a dual extraction of Chaga. Uh, with uh, with a hot water extraction and then an alcohol extraction, and that stuff is like lifeblood. Mm. I tell you what, I mean that's great that that Onnit's putting it in Shroom Tech, uh, but it was an interesting experiment to actually do the hot water extraction and the alcohol extraction. Cool, cool use for for vodka. <laughs> so, uh, okay, I'm, I'm done now. Fine, I'm done. Though. Absolutely, man. One. We just talked about the um, the chaga and the dual extraction uh, on his show mm -hmm. recently. And man, I mean, this guy, mm -hmm. see, this is the thing I love about Ben and what everybody's going to learn is that, no, he, he does the stuff, mm -hmm. you know, like he gets out and he finds a way to actually put stuff into action. I mean, he's done so many kind of self-quantifying experiments and just finding out because really the only way you can truly know something is if you experience it firsthand. Right. And that's what I really love yeah, about it. Yeah, I've him. I've had a lot of explosive diarrhea. <laughs> 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 Disaster <laughs> pants. <laughs> hey, so, you know, we got a chance to hang out uh, a couple of times, but I don't know your origin story, you know, your superhero Ben Greenfield origin story, like how you even got involved in health and fitness in the first place. What inspired you to get into this field? Yeah, well, I... Uh, was a kind of a typical uh, American kid. I grew up playing, you know, baseball and soccer and uh, football and tennis. And when I was 13, my parents asked me that question that parents seem to ask their kids a lot, which is you got to taper down and choose one. So I chose tennis and really got hardcore into tennis. I uh, played tennis all through high school, wound up playing tennis in college. And like most of the other student athletes, I declared myself a PE major. It's called oh, kinesiology, right. which is like glorified PE. Kinesiology just sounds a, a heck of a lot more smart. Anyways, though, I uh, I kind of quit tennis after a couple of years, branched out, you know, played water polo, volleyball, uh, basketball, pretty much, you know, any anything, you name it, I tried it. I was managing the local wellness center, so I got into like spinning and lifting and bodybuilding and personal training and was just really soaking up everything health and fitness so much that I actually got very interested in medicine and I even uh, completed my, my entire uh, pre-med course as well while I was studying uh, for my bachelor's degree in exercise science. And then um, once I graduated, I got accepted to a few medical schools, but decided that I wanted to reapply and try and get into some of the bigger schools that I didn't get accepted to, like Harvard and Yale and Duke. And so I, w I wanted to be a sports medicine doctor, an orthopedic surgeon. And 
um, I went back for my master's degree, got a master's degree in um, human uh, uh, nutrition and biomechanics. So it was like a self-directed course and I threw in a lot of pharmaceuticals on the side. So just studying the way the molecules interact with the human body. Yeah. And kind of got headhunted out of that by a by a hip and knee surgical sales company. So I saw the dollar signs and I graduated, went to work for them. Absolutely just did not enjoy that job at all. So um, after about three months, I quit. I walked across the street um, from the apartment that I was living in, walked into the gym across the street, asked for a job as a personal trainer. And at that point, I had been personal training for like four years. Mm -hmm. I knew my stuff. I had all the degrees and everything. So they hired me. And within you know, a week, I was personal training full time, you know, 5 a.m. till 10 p.m., you know, mm -hmm. just, just basically helping, helping 40 year old moms like get in their bikinis, basically. It was <laughs> kind of the, the gig at that particular gym. So uh, I, I did that for a while. I wound up branching out, starting a lot of my own personal training studios and gyms. And uh, my model was I partnered with local physicians in the community and really kind of practiced this whole exercise as medicine thing uh, to help their patients once they'd finish up, you know, management of diabetes, obesity, et cetera. They'd send them over to me. And I invested in everything from resting metabolic rate and indirect calorimetry equipment to test like VO2 max, carbs, burnt, fat burnt to high speed video cameras for a lot of like the triathletes, marathoners, et cetera. And um, I was doing a lot of kind of cutting edge stuff back then. Um, did a lot of like blood work. We were doing like platelet rich plasma injections, which I talked with you about um, when, when you came on my show and you know, we were talking about you know, stem cell therapies and things like that. And um, eventually I was, I was, as you mentioned, I was voted as, as the 2008 personal trainer of the year. So at that point I started like, you know, stuff kind of blew up. I started speaking at all these health and fitness events. And um, at one event that I was speaking at, I realized that what I was doing was not sustainable in terms of running all these gyms, working from the wee hours in the morning till freaking, you know, late, late at night. And my wife was pregnant at the time with, uh, with our little twin boys who are seven now. And so I decided after listening in at a few of these health and fitness events to people talking about things like, um, you know, online videos and YouTube and, you know, uh, marketing online and kind of like uh, putting, putting your information out there for a greater number of people. I wound up uh, in late 2008 basically selling all my gym equipment, um, quitting all my personal training gigs, and mm -hmm. essentially moved into the house in my underwear, started uh, writing books, writing online programs, um, experimented with starting a podcast, which has been going for uh, seven years now. And you know, started doing videos and, and PDFs, and kind of kind of flipped over to a new chapter in life, which is basically what I do now. I put on a shirt for this podcast, but mostly I'm in my underwear uh, at home, uh, helping people around the world. Do a little bit of online coaching and consulting. Um, do some podcasting, some blogging, some videos. I still you know travel around, doing a lot of speaking and stuff like that. But you know, essentially, I went from kind of a, a gym rat to uh, to an internet nerd. So, with the exception being, I don't live in my mom's basement or play multiplayer uh, <laughs> fantasy games. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of that's kind of my story. You know, it's it's I've always been in the fitness and yeah. health arena. Yeah. You know, I I never went through a time when I was like. Uh, necessarily fat, sick, and unhealthy, but I've certainly, um, you know, I was a bodybuilder, and I realized back then that the high protein, low carb, low fat, um, body part split, inflammatory style training was not healthy. And then I was an Ironman triathlete for ten years, and realized eventually that maybe you know voluminous endurance training is not the best thing for your, your thyroid or your testosterone. And I've right. experimented with you know ninety percent fat ketogenic diet for a year, and you know now I do like Spartan and obstacle course training, which is a little less voluminous, a little yeah. more intense, a little more lifting, maybe a little bit more ancestral, that and some uh, some hunting and um, so yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm at now. That's awesome, man, mm -hmm. and that's what you know has really created such value that you give is you've done all of this stuff. You know, <laughs> he went head over heels into the personal training world mm -hmm. for years and then pulled all of that knowledge out to be able to share on this platform, and I think that's really valuable because a lot of people, I think, we tend to get ahead of ourselves, like. I want to start this big thing, mm -hmm. but we got to get that experience first so that we have more to share. 
you know, I think it's, yeah, I get a lot of, a lot of personal trainers will ask me that there'll be, you know, these young personal trainers who are still whatever sophomores, juniors in college, or even getting their master's degree, they'll approach me and say, Hey, how do I do what you're doing? Right. Right. Like, how do I write a book about fitness or nutrition? Or how do I, I start a podcast about fat loss. And my answer to them is always the same. I tell them go work brick and mortar for five to 10 years, bust your ass seeing every single body type out there, training people, seeing how they respond to different exercise protocols, seeing when they start to sweat, when they start to breathe hard, how fast fat actually does come off and where it comes off and how to weigh people and do skin fold calipers and all that stuff. Like you, you have to do that to really truly understand how the human body responds to specific exercise and nutrition protocols. You have to put your time in the trenches, not just for other people, but for yourself too. As you know, Sean, there's a lot of people in the, in the fitness world who are, um, who are fat and unfit basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is so true. And I think the big thing that you're saying right now is, you know, if you want to do something similar, because I get the same question all the time is help people, you know, first, but also you're going to be helping yourself in the process and being able to really hands on problem solve, which there's nothing more valuable than that. And people can pick that up when we talk, you know, it's right there front and center. And so I want to know something um, on your track, you know, so in school, what dissuaded you from still going on and pursuing the medical degree and kind of doing what you're doing because I know firsthand yeah. that a lot of physicians out there listening right now and th- that listen to your show actually come to you for advice and and you guys help each other and learning from top physicians and also them learning from us so what dissuaded you from going back to school there was not one single doc over those three months and I spent every day um, at the hospital or in the operating room you know pointing a little laser pointer during the surgery at the you know which pieces went where for the hips and the knees not one doctor over that entire first three months told me that I should go and be a doctor every single one told me that I would be crazy to go to medical school I shouldn't be a doctor the entire face of medicine was changing they were all unhappy they had big houses boats no time to spend with their family or play with any of their toys or when they did have something scheduled they would do something like hastily complete a surgery or cut a patient's time short so that they could go and make it in time to get their golf game in. Just the whole atmosphere left a bitter nasty taste in my mouth. Granted there is this whole other side of medicine, functional medicine Mm -hmm. and uh, a naturopathy and amazing MDs who are doing amazing things but I wanted to work in sports and athletics and you know that in none of that scene from a medical standpoint seemed to be dialed in at all and it, it just left a, a really bad taste in my mouth. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I really appreciate that you recommend and advise the the new trainers to spend the time learning people so that the experiments don't become experiments on us as the people that right. come to them. So, you know, one of the things that I'd look for is well that I look for until I found Sean, I'll never look again, (laughs) Um, is that, well, how long have you done this? And have you worked with anybody that has my my situation or body type? And, you know, over over the course of time, many were just figuring it out on us. Yep, exactly. Yeah, you have to see how people move. You have to see how people react to, like I was mentioning, specific workout routines in real time Mm -hmm. there standing with them and and you can only replicate so much virtually because yeah. there's no common denominator no complete common denominator that everybody has their individual needs is that why yeah a big part of it is that everybody has their individual needs and then another part of it is sometimes you just have to have enough experience seeing flesh and blood move and react to workout routines and diets and you know, it's, it's just, you know, now I work with clients and I track heart rate variability and they send me all their photos of their foods. So they all have Instagram or Flickr accounts and I have access to each of their accounts. I have access to their, their morning heart rate measurements. They all use like the Bedit or the Motion X or some kind of a sleep tracker and I have access to their sleep and I lay out their workouts, I lay out their nutrition protocols, but still, if someone is squatting improperly under that barbell, 
you know, there's there's still a disconnect there, right? Like I can't see that. I can't I can't see, for example, their functional movement screen. So a lot of times when I'm working with somebody virtually, they still have somebody boots on the ground there where they're at to be able to watch them say do their clean and jerk, their squat and their push press to ensure that they're moving properly. So that's you know, that's that's the big thing about virtual online health consulting or fitness consulting or something like that. Like you have to have that hands on component too and figure out a way to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that you brought up in your story was the endurance track that you took and doing the Ironman competitions and things like that, but also bodybuilding. And you've just done a lot of stuff, you know? And so I, I'm, I'm really feeling that we have the same story of like, in the beginning, being pretty dogmatic about this is supposed to work for you. And then kind of over time, understanding like, I don't know what I was thinking, you know, like everybody's different. And being able to have a lot of different tools from the superhero utility belt to be able to use for different people instead of being dogmatic about it. But I'm curious, man, myself. So I know that you still do compete in in things like the Spartan Race and, and things like that. So what motivates you to do those type of activities? Not health. So I've, <laughs> I've, never, I've never argued that anything from bodybuilding to Ironman triathlon to Spartan Racing is going to make you live longer. Right. When we look at all the blue zones and the areas of longevity, really exercise is pretty low down on the totem pole. It's general levels of physical activity during the day when you're looking at things from an activity standpoint, you know, such as gardening and cleaning and hunting and foraging and walks in the sunshine and those type of things, not hard, masochistic, super intense intervals. You know, even, you know, like when I go hunting, if I'm off hunting for, say, like a week, there might be two times that I'm gassed for any longer than two minutes. You know, maybe it's it's a real steep hike up a hill because whatever, there's elk on the other side and we got a boogie up there to see him. But for the most part, it's very low level physical activity during the day, not even like, you know, going on a long run, but more like just kind of hiking around, right? Like that's kind of the level of physical activity. You mix that with a little bit of heavy lifting here and there, you know, lifting logs, rocks, or, you know, weight plates. And you mix that with, um, you know, proper lifestyle, relationship, love, et cetera, et cetera. It's the kind of things I know you talk about, Sean, and you've got a, a pretty good program for longevity or for looking good naked or whatever your goals are. <laughs> but when it comes to Spartan and obstacle course training and triathlon and Ironman, um, that's, a, that's kind of a mixed bag. Part of it is, for me, the fact that I love to go out and compete. I'm hardwired to want to be uh, – on the starting line of an event, rubbing shoulders with other people and getting ready to go to frigging battle, right? Like I, I feel like maybe part of me is just, you know, I, I would have been a, a warrior or somebody who, who liked to fight or something. Like I cannot go a few months without going and competing in some kind of hardcore event. So yeah. the competition just feeds my energy. Yeah. I love it. I thrive on it. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that you know, a lot of times I think in, in our modern day and age, you know, for me, for example, like I mentioned, I sit at home a lot in my underwear working on my laptop and part of me just wants to go out and slay a freaking dragon, yeah. right? You want to you wanna go out and, and do something hard that kind of scares you a little bit. So that's another reason is, is it's a way for me to live life a little bit more fully. Um, and, you know, uh, part of it too is that there are a a lot of other people who feel the same way I do, who feel like they want to go compete, they want to go to battle, they want to go out and just do something that really challenges their brain and their body. Yeah, it may create an inflammatory firestorm for a few days after that event. Yeah, you might even get a little bit of, of thyroid or testosterone disruption from, from training for something like that. But ultimately, you know, there's a little bit of a trade-off in terms of like happiness and yeah. that, that feeling that you get when you throw your arms up at the finish line with a big smile on your face and you've climbed your own personal Mount Everest. And when people People want that feeling of achievement and similar to the, the want that I have. I know that for me to to advise them or to speak intelligently on these things, kind of returning you know full circle to what we were just talking about, I also got to put time in the trenches because yeah. there are some days I roll out of bed and I'm like, I don't want to go climb a rope in my backyard and go like drag cinder blocks up the driveway. But if I want to go and compete well in this next event that I have and inspire other people and also be able to teach other people what it feels like to carry a gravel filled bucket 100 yards i gotta go fill a bucket with gravel and carry it 100 yards yeah. like i need to know what that feels like and how to train for it oh so man what does that feel like by the way 
<laughs> your back locks up your your finger the trick is like to carry a bucket like that you got to kind of use like your bones like put it on your hip and lock your wrist together the trick with with most of these things is efficiency right like right. trying not to use your your muscles as much and trying to figure out other ways to use your body love it man there's so much richness in what he just said even though it's just kind of a subtle story Mm -hmm. you know but enough can't be said about actually doing something that brings you Mm -hmm. joy and Mm -hmm. that brings you uh livelihood you know something that really kind of just boils your blood yeah i was talking with with i interviewed a kim anami recently in my podcast and and she teaches like sex courses and one of the questions i asked her was like how is that healthy to stay up all night having tantric sex you know the, all the evidence shows that you're supposed to get seven to nine hours of sleep a night and she's like sometimes it's not just about health right sometimes it's about just like joy and happiness and having great sex even though you're missing a night of sleep and then exactly. at the end of the day that is good for your health <laughs> and, exactly yep. and it's good for your sleep uh, when you do go that? to sleep you know <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah. and they, they did just come out with a study that showed that that the effects of chronic sleep restriction can can be reversed. And in this case, it was something like three months of chronic sleep restriction reversed with three nights of good sleep. So even though chronic sleep restriction does have some nasty effects on, you know, as, as you know, Sean, because I know you've written a whole book on this, you know, leptin and, and ghrelin and other hormones, uh, it can be reversed once you once you get some catch-up sleep in. They right. actually just published that study uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He, I mean, he's right on the money. You know, this is like, it, it's this stuff is so simple. Our bodies are so forgiving, you know, and also there's just innate intelligence. You know, when you just start stacking the conditions and doing some stuff right, how quickly, because your genetic um, your genetic cards want to evolve. They want to get better. They want to keep being able to move forward. So when we stop screwing around and eating like goldfish crackers and like, <laughs> you know, doing 10 Spartan races in a, in a row, right. then your body's going to be able to sort itself out. Mm-hmm. But, you know, but in the meantime, at some point you can enjoy, good, yeah, enjoy the goldfish it. cracker, mm-hmm. you know, if mm-hmm. it's, you know, apocalypse or whatever, you know, but <laughs> I don't recommend it, but just we've got to keep a balance with this stuff because I know Ben too, like we've both done this, like we can get really neurotic about this stuff and it's really about having a good time, enjoying yourself. And also I think another big point to bring up with what you're doing is putting something out in front of you, you know, because I'm assuming that that would motivate you just to know that I've got this race coming up in two months. Oh yeah. I, I, I have a hard time getting motivated unless I have something I'm training for. I just do. Like I, I usually will not devote myself to a workout unless I have something on the calendar one, two, three months away. So it's like this constant cycle, right? Like you cross the finish line of one race and you sign up for the next one, you sign yeah. up for the next one. And it's a really cool way to keep yourself motivated. Yeah. I mean, that's actually the number one thing I tell people when they ask me, how can I get motivated to go to the gym? I tell them, sign up for something. Yeah. I don't care what it is, a 5K, a weight loss challenge, a, a fitness or bodybuilding or fitness modeling show. Like it kind of depends what level you're at but you sign up for something to light that fire under you that i think was that's one of those brilliant. great tips you said you shared with us early on when we were trying to figure out what our motivation can be if we haven't had it before and sean said set goals yeah. set goals like uh something that will put a deadline that you can't break yourself right, so right. a, a so. deadline that also involves embarrassment right Ooh, like so you've got yeah. a little bit of that extrinsic <laughs> motivation you know like back when i was i was doing bodybuilding was the fact that i had to get on stage in the equivalent of my mom's underwear you know, up there in front of a thousand people and, and look good. Yeah. Um, you know, or in something like, you know, I, I did all sorts of tricks. Like when I would race triathlon, I would pre-schedule a bunch of tweets to tweet out where I was at at a specific time on the mm. course so that I did, if I didn't make it there in time, it looked bad on my Twitter feed. You know, mm. there, there's all sorts of, of little things that happen when you, when you're out doing an event in terms of just public embarrassment, if you don't do well. And or or if you don't finish it, or if you if you show up and you don't look prepared, so that's a big part of it too. Is just that extrinsic motivation of an event, and that's why signing up for say some kind of a weight loss competition is better than creating a quanti- quantifiable goal like I want to lose twenty pounds. Just because that's just you and your twenty pounds. The weight loss challenge is you and a bunch of other people, and typically somebody managing the event that you're accountable to. Yeah, the that's weight loss level, the weight the loss event. or the race or whatever you're involved in, it really boils down to psychology, Mm -hmm. always, you know, and finding ways to leverage your own personal psychology because Ben is different from me, you know, and it's thinking, and I really, I think it's a really valuable insight to take away of like putting something out in front of yourself. For somebody like myself, I'm like, I wanna stay ready for whatever is gonna be presented in my life. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna, I don't like having something off in the distance like that. Like I've got a, 
a thing coming up in two months because I'm I'm more uh, flexible. You want to be ready. Yeah, now. Stay I just want to be. Yeah, I, yeah, you yeah like that's to the stay that's my approach to, to training. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm not thinking about yeah. stuff like that. You're a little bit more of a zombie apocalypse trainer then. <laughs> you just, just want to be like you want to be like Batman. You want to have power, strength, speed, endurance, and be ready for any zombies that come your way. Yeah, Which you know if that's that. if that motivates you. The technically though, I gotta tell you, the zombie apocalypse is kind of something you know. Not that concrete, far out in the future. So I'm maybe you're training for it's a future. It's a good event. motivator. I want to be able to run. It's kind of <laughs> happening. Have you been on the city bus? I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, yeah. No. If uh, I need to get away, one I of the be things. One of the things that uh, you mentioned while you were were talking were was um, building muscle. So mm. let's talk a little bit about that because you know Ben Greenfield Fitness. You know you're the guy behind that, and a lot of people look to you to understand this stuff. So. Uh, can you give us like a rudimentary understanding about like how how does muscle grow? Is muscle growth the same as functionality? You know, is um what is hypertrophy? Can you talk a little bit about that stuff? Yeah, muscle growth and muscle functionality are are much different, which is one of the reasons why you know sports like CrossFit are getting a lot more popular because people are figuring out that it's not about having big muscles that don't move well or function well in the sports that you want to play or your your activities of daily living it's about having muscles that that are coordinated and and move well together so when i was a bodybuilder i did a lot of single joint exercises leg extensions and bicep curls and moves that built muscle in that specific body part and frankly the way that you do it the way that you get big muscles and then there there's some myths out there about muscle building but when it comes to the most efficient, fastest way to build muscle like a bodybuilder to actually get hypertrophy and new growth of muscle fibers is to just beat the heck out of one specific body part and then give, give it full rest. I mean, there's a reason that bodybuilders train the way that they do. There's a reason they train differently than power lifters. There's a reason they train differently than crossfitters because they know that the best way to get swole is to take like your biceps, work your biceps for an hour on a Monday, completely bomb them with seated curls and preacher curls and cable curls, standing dumbbell curls, reverse curls, and then finish up with maybe um, you know uh, reverse grip pull-ups, and then not touch your biceps for like four or five days or even a week. And that's basically a body split style workout where you're just tearing the heck out of a muscle, making it look like World War II from an inflammatory standpoint, sending a big message to all the satellite cells in that area to regrow and to cause new muscle fiber to get laid down to be able to, to handle that stress again should it happen. And that's how you build muscle. So you might do, you know, buys and tries on a Monday and chest, back and shoulders on a Tuesday, legs and core on a Wednesday take a Thursday off or use a Thursday for cardio training, rinse, wash, and repeat, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so that'd be like a sample uh, four-day split, for example. Yeah. Um, in, in contrast to that, you, know, you can also do something more like a multi-joint workout, you know, like I did this morning, for example, where I do um, five sets of a squat, five sets of a deadlift, five sets of an overhead press, five sets of a pull-up, and five sets of a push-up, uh, like a like a loaded push-up, which I just prefer to something like a bench press where you're laying on your back. And I'll go through each of those sets. Each one is using multiple body parts. Five reps is really not enough to beat down a muscle to the point where you're going to lay down a lot of new muscle growth. But for me, it's building strength. It's building the ability for multiple joints to move all at, all at the same time. And there's a lot of a lot of effects too on things like growth hormone and testosterone when you lift heavy and low reps like that versus like a, like a bodybuilding style approach. So that's kind of the difference between the hypertrophy and the functionality. But that being said, there there are some exceptions to the rule. Um, for example, you know, in 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 bodybuilding or in people who want to, because frankly, there are some people who want a bigger chest or they want to fill out their T-shirt more nicely, or they want to lay down a little bit more more pump in their six pack or whatever the case may be. In a situation like that, most of the prevailing literature says that you need to um, lift to exhaustion using like somewhere in the range of anywhere from 8 to 15 reps mm -hmm. for hypertrophy, using like 70 to 80 percent of your one rep max. Like that's a traditional hypertrophy style routine. 
Um, the fact is that, that and there was a research study that came out in the National Journal of Strength Conditioning Research last year that showed that you can build muscle or maintain muscle, which again, and, and we're not just talking about useless muscle. This can be functional muscle too, uh, by using body weight or very light weights, but you must exercise to complete fatigue if you use that approach approach, right? So you can build muscle doing a prison style workout, right? Like push-ups, body weight squats, pull-ups, etc. You can tone muscle, you can maintain muscle using that approach. You don't actually need weights. Instead, all you have to do is go to fatigue and typically that requires 30 plus reps of a body weight style exercise. So that's one thing is you don't, you don't actually have to have weights. Um, the other thing is that uh, you actually, in some cases, don't even need to lift to maintain muscle. Mm. And this is something that, that I use almost every day. I do a lot of sauna. You do much sauna at all, Sean? Every now and then. It, that's that's yeah. not something that uh, has been consistent for me, but I love it. Yeah. Mm. yeah so you're so talking the, about infrared? The heat shock proteins, the heat shock proteins that you produce when you sauna have actually been shown to help you to maintain muscle. So mm -hmm. if you're in a situation where you can't lift or it's like a recovery day and you still want to give your muscles a stimulus, you can go and sauna for 20 to 30 minutes, get yourself nice and hot, and that sends a message to your muscles to build more of these heat shock proteins which stave off catabolic muscle loss. So that's another interesting thing about muscle is you don't, you don't need to, to lift at all to, to stimulate muscle to a certain extent. Um, so really quickly, guess, Ben, oh, go uh, ahead. with the with the sauna, so are we talking about conventional sauna or infrared? When it comes to heat shock proteins, most of that comes down to the amount of heat, right? Mm -hmm. So it could be dry heat, it could be wet heat, it could be infrared. I'm not a fan of wet heat because most of the gyms that use wet heat, they don't filter the water first, right? So you're yeah. breathing in uh, uh, like fluoride, chlorine, whatever happens to be in the water, you get in the steam room in a typical gym. Mm -hmm. So I steer clear of those. There's also some mold and fungus potential issues with, with steam rooms. Right. It's gross. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, the, the dry saunas, those aren't bad, but the problem with the dry saunas is that heat doesn't actually penetrate into your body like infrared rays do. So with, with dry saunas, you can still get the production of the heat shock proteins because you get nice and hot. You don't get a lot of the potential toxicity effects of a wet sauna. But with an infrared, you actually get the rays from an infrared sauna penetrating deeper into your body because those are, those are actual rays that can pass through skin. And with infrared, you get a little bit more of a detoxification effect, meaning loss of things like metals through the skin. You also get what's called lipolysis of some of the fat cells when they vibrate at a higher frequencies when those infrared rays hit them. And so um, I'm, I'm the biggest fan of infrared. I've, I've got an infrared sauna at my house, but what I've done is I've insulated it, um, basically ripped the ceiling off, added a bunch of insulation, stuck a cork in where, the, where the, uh, the temperature detector is so it gets really hot in there. So I get the benefits of both the very, very hot dry sauna as well as the infrared. So I'll do like high-dose niacin before I get in the infrared oh, sauna, yeah. and that steps up some of the fat cell lipolysis and the blood flow. Um, you'll get even more of an effect if you go in hot, right? So if you like run 20 minutes, then you get in the infrared, and then you just get a huge dump of these heat shock proteins, a um, lot of sweat. So I'm, I'm a big fan of sauna uh, when it comes to maintenance of muscle mass as well as a lot of other cool effects. Yeah. Um, the last interesting thing, I guess, with, with hypertrophy or muscle building is a lot of people think that you need to eat a lot of carbohydrates to achieve that. Mm -hmm. And there was another study that came out earlier this month on a ketogenic diet used in weightlifters. And what they found was that even on a very high fat intake, 80 plus percent fat intake, that these weightlifters were still able to build muscle mass in a similar manner as they would build it if they were on a carb-based diet. So it turns out that a high amount of carbs, you know, you get a lot of weightlifters, for example, consuming maltodextrin or potato-based starch um, or a lot of these like protein-carb combos post-workout, it turns out that somehow the backbone of fat allows for you to, to cleave that and produce energy while you're lifting weights or allow for adequate repair of muscle tissue, even in the absence of a high amount of carbohydrates. So um, you actually don't have to, to dump too many carbs down the hatch either, which is interesting. Wow. And then with the carbohydrate, overconsumption is going to lead to things like uh, more advanced glycation end products, more uh, blood sugar, just mayhem yeah you know? potentially potentially there there are some populations that do a high carbon diet no, i'm talking diet. about i'm talking about halloween candy bro
Okay. Yeah. I mean, well, te- <laughs> technically. Okay. So this is the interesting thing because uh, Denise Minger, who does a lot of of really good writing and research on on dietary um, macronutrient ratios specifically, is one thing that she looks at quite a bit. She just published a really interesting article that shows that even processed sugar and starch and just like pure like rice, potato, candy, orange juice, that type of stuff, if your fat intake is below 10% and you're taking in those type of carbohydrates, there are some studies that have shown some really interesting things like um, a reversal of insulin resistance mm. and um, benefits from multiple sclerosis and, and things along those lines that seem kind of shocking. And, and her thoughts, I was talking to her about this recently is that it may have to do with something called the Randall equation, which dictates that in the absence of other macronutrients like fats and proteins, in the presence of a high amount of carbs, your body can shift towards really efficient glucose utilization. Um, The thing is though, we're talking about very low fat, like like less than 10% fat and very high carb, like 90 plus percent carb, very little protein, so you aren't getting as many of the advanced glycation end products. And the the one consideration that you got to bear in mind with studies like that is they're not looking at nerve health, yeah. they're not looking at hormone health, and they're not looking at a lot of other parameters that are highly dependent upon adequate levels of essential fatty acids, fat soluble vitamins, uh, saturated fat for cholesterol, for cell membrane formation, and a lot of the other benefits that come from fat. So yeah, we we can't completely eschew a high carbohydrate diet, uh, assuming that that fats are low enough. Right. Um, at the same time, though, I've got some some liver pate upstairs in the mm-hmm. refrigerator, thawing out right now for lunch, um, and I uh, I can't do the high carb thing. Yeah, so you know, there's so much interesting. What, what you've just done, you've given a little bit of justification to something like the eighty ten ten diet, mm-hmm. which is I even read the book in my curiosity long ago, but you know, basically 80% of your macronutrients coming from carbohydrates, 10% protein, 10% fats. And some people are apparently thriving on that type of nutrition. Now at the other side of the story, you just mentioned, what about hormone health? What about some of these other really important biomarkers besides, you know, your body kind of sorting out the blood sugar issue, probably because you're eating a lot more of it. But I think the issue really is, uh, when we have a high fat and high carbohydrate, Diet. That's the issue. Yeah. That's the issue. And actually the issue arises once once you have uh, modern sugars, processed carbs, etc., it appears that once fat goes above about 10% of total daily intake, right? And and remember what the US government defines as low fat is less than 30%. Okay, but it appears that once fat intake goes above 10%, that's when a high intake of processed carbohydrates becomes deleterious. That's when high blood sugar can cause things like adherence of glucose to cholesterol particles, plaque formation, atherosclerosis, et cetera. Right. And that's oh. with that's simultaneously with a higher carbo- carbohydrate intake. I just want to make yep. this clear because it's not that a higher fat diet is a problem. That's what Ben is actually doing. And that's what most of my nutrition looks like as well. Mm-hmm. But I'm really fascinated because of the study you mentioned, which I haven't heard about this study yet, that building um, muscle using, using a ketogenic diet. And here's the thing is because let's be honest, it's probably a little bit easier to eat a lot of carbohydrates. I mean, donuts are easy to eat, sweet potatoes, super easy to eat, to, to build mm-hmm. muscle. How would we go about doing that? You know, as far as getting in enough nutrition and enough, um, protein, enough, um, just overall macronutrients and calories to even build muscle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in terms of protein, you actually don't need as much protein as a lot of people think that you need in order to build muscle. It's about 0.5 to 0.8 grams per pound of protein necessary. Um, the low or in like the 0.5 would be closer to muscle maintenance. 0.8 grams per pound would be closer to like a like a higher end muscle building type of protocol. That's about half of what a lot of people are consuming to build muscle. So a, there's less protein than what we think is necessary. Um, B, a lot of that excess protein can get converted into carbs via gluconeogenesis if you're not careful with your protein intake. And that's why a lot of, uh, of ketogenic dieters will use amino acids like branch chain amino acids or essential amino acids as supplements to provide adequate protein for lean muscle repair and recovery without getting a lot of the calories of a protein source like whey or pea or rice or a steak. 
So that's one thing is to build muscle on a ketogenic diet, typically some kind of amino acid supplementation is necessary. Um, as far as carbohydrates go, you can maintain a, a, like a, like a ketotic, um, you know, which, which would just basically mean like you're burning a lot of fats and the burning of fats creates ketones. You can maintain that state if you shift most of your carbohydrate intake for the day that you do take in to a post-workout scenario. So let's say you're going to eat as an active person, a hundred grams of carbohydrates per day, which is 400 uh, calories of carbohydrates per day. Then you would eat the majority of those 400 calories, say like two large yams or sweet potatoes with some sea salt and some, some. Uh, like raw local honey on them and you would eat that post-workout scenario and then the rest of your diet during the day would be a high amount of vegetables and plant-based matter which uh, and those those are carbohydrates that don't count because those are just all like fiber-based carbohydrates along with low to moderate amounts of protein and high amounts of oils and fats. So for example, you might do a big green smoothie with lots of coconut oil and almond butter and some seeds and nuts and an avocado for breakfast. And then you'd have a large vegetable salad at lunch with, again, seeds, nuts, avocado, avocado, olives, you could do like a little bit of sardines or some kind of wild caught fish. You'd do your workout, let's say in the afternoon, right after your workout, you'd do something like sweet potatoes, yams, etc. And then dinner might be, you know, fish, liver, steak, whatever, with a side of asparagus or broccoli, and then another bolus of fat, like some olive oil or some seeds and nuts or some kind of a butter or something like that. Um, and then dessert might be like a, like a full fat coconut milk blend it up with some chocolate stevia, some coconut flakes, and a little bit of like, you know, 90% plus dark chocolate. So, you know, that that's how you would actually get enough calories in to be able to build muscle, uh, adequate amounts of protein, and then enough carbohydrates to where you don't experience things like, you know, loss of mucus and loss of like proper, uh, proper like glycoprotein for your joints and things along those lines. Um, but not so much carbohydrate that you create some of the inflammatory issues that we just talked about. So that's kind of like what a sample day would look like. Yeah, wow. that's fantastic. And it seems really doable as well, mm -hmm. you know, how you laid it all out there. And a lot of people that are undertaking a ketogenic approach, you know, can get in some kind of weird fear about carbohydrates. And just like you said, you can still s stay around in that zone and be able to indulge a little bit, you know, in some carbohydrates is really the placement. You just mentioned also post-workout, which is a really smart right. thing. Why would you do that post-workout versus in the morning? Just, it's just pure insulin sensitivity. Basically what happens is you get upregulation of GLUT4 transporters, which are responsible for taking carbohydrates and transporting them into muscle tissue to be stored away as glycogen for the next day's activities. And when you have increased expression of that particular transporter, you need less insulin to actually shove glucose ac across the membrane and into muscle tissue. So your pancreas produces less insulin, you get less blood sugar fluctuations, and blood sugar stays in your bloodstream for a shorter period of time. And when you've got glucose in your bloodstream for a shorter period of time, that means that your body is again going to rely on fatty acids and the byproduct of fatty acid breakdown, ketones, as the primary source of fuel rather than glucose. Right. And also you just mentioned, and that's so, it's just, again, it's not just what you do, but when you do it as well. But um, another thing that a lot of people don't realize that your, your uh, pancreas is producing one of two things, basically, not just insulin, which insulin is a primary kind of energy storing uh, hormone, but it also produces glucagon, which is, it does the opposite. So this can help to uh, aid in the breakdown of stored fatty acids as well. But you've got to put your body in the right state to be able to do it. If you're turning on insulin constantly by guzzling down, you know, um, sweet potatoes, which are awesome, or donuts, which I mentioned, mentioned earlier, it's going to be a little bit more difficult for your body to do this process. But you mentioned something uh, you mentioned fat burning and or fat loss and ketones. So let's talk a little bit more about fat loss. Are there any? And I, you also mentioned earlier the niacin. I played around with that for about a year as well. I would do the niacin, and I would like this is some crazy stuff. But you do crazy stuff too. But I'd get like the whole like bundled up like Rocky gear, about to go out running. Mm -hmm. But then I'd jump on my uh, on my rebounder for yep. you know maybe 20, 30 minutes, and then I take the niacin beforehand, so I'm getting a real good sweat going. And it was for the purpose when I was doing that and playing around with that was more so for the accelerated expedition of like um, 
xenoestrogens and things like that, just rogue materials in your body, detoxification overall. But mm -hmm. I didn't realize the fat loss aspect until much later. So can we talk a little bit about some of the interesting kind of fat loss, maybe some hacks or some things that are foundational that people should be doing that a lot of people don't realize? Sure. For the most part with exercise and dietary restriction, you get uh, loss of fat stores from fat cells and basically a shrinking of fat cells. And what you'd ideally like is a conversion of those fat cells into a different type of cell or just apoptosis or cell death of that fat cell through something like lipolysis. And so if you're just relying upon exercise and nutrition and then you start to overeat again or you stop exercise for a little while, what happens is you get fat again very easily. You get that whole yo-yo dieting type right. of thing. When you mix in some other things that either cause conversion of fat cells into other types of cells or apoptosis, death of fat cells, then you can keep off weight for a longer period of time and not have that yo-yo type of effect. One example is what we just talked about when it comes to fat cell death combining heat with something like niacin and doing, say, like a, a daily or several times per week uh, sauna in the presence of niacin without a lot of food in your bloodstream. Um, and so that would be something like get up in the morning, drink a cup of coffee, run 10 to 15 minutes, and then get in a sauna with and, – and you take the niacin like before you drink the coffee, and then you just sweat things out in the morning. That would be one example. Uh, another example, uh, an example of conversion of fat cells to a different type of cell would be the conversion of white adipose tissue to brown adipose tissue. Brown adipose tissue is metabolically active tissue that burns calories to generate heat. And the way that you can get that conversion is via exposure to cold. So for example, right now in my office, it is 55 degrees. I put on a shirt for this podcast, but normally I'd be standing shirtless in my office working. So I get a little bit of a, of a cold effect just from doing that as well as an enhanced calorie burn. But then if you really want to accelerate, you use something like cold water immersion or cryotherapy to achieve this same effect. And that would be, for example, going out and uh, getting in a, in a cold pool for 20 minutes three times per week. Or, and this is something I have all my clients do, take a cold shower in the morning and a cold shower in the evening for five minutes. And that's it. That's a really good kind of like entry level point to get used to the cold. Um, other examples, like I mentioned, would be keeping your house a little bit cooler than usual, sleeping in a nice cool bedroom, which helps with sleep anyways. Um, and there's, there's some evidence that there's two particular components that may speed up the conversion of white adipose tissue to brown adipose tissue. One is curcumin. Another is bitter melon extract. Mm -hmm. And so you can, for example, in the same way that you stack niacin with heat, you can stack bitter melon extract or curcumin with cold exposure to get increased conversion of white adipose to brown adipose. And you know, I, I like to, after exposure to cold, I like to force my body to warm itself, right? So I've got like a hot tub outside next to a, a cold pool. And it's very tempting to go jump in the hot tub after you <laughs> soak in the cold pool. Extremely tempting. Like I walk past it as soon as I finish and I, every cell in my body wants to jump in the hot tub. But instead I go inside, I towel myself off and I force my body to learn how to warm itself and I burn calories to warm itself. And that's a really, really good uh, fat loss method as well. Um, probably the last one that I like just because of all the longevity benefits as well as the ability to, to allow for apoptosis is just basic intermittent fasting, having a certain period of time each day where you go 12 to 16 hours without eating. So that might mean if you finish dinner at 7 p.m., you pull out your watch. I tell a lot of people to do this because a lot of times you think you haven't eaten for 12 hours, but it's right. been like eight hours. And you set the clock and you tell yourself, okay, I'm done with dinner. Push yourself away from the table. I'm not getting it again for 12 hours or for 16 hours. I don't recommend much more than 16 hours just because it can get a little tough to get all the nutrients and the calories that you need into an eight-hour compressed feeding window right. if you're using a 16-hour daily intermittent fast. But say like, you know, seven. 7 a or 7 p.m. till 7 a.m. You're not going to eat food, and that's sustainable for most people. Yeah, and you know we've of course done shows talking about a lot of this stuff, and mm -hmm. I can't agree with you more on these things, and especially being able to modulate heat. You know, we've become very domesticated, and we're constantly keeping our our atmosphere at this perfect temperature for us, and we get uncomfortable very quickly. You know, and so. Just being able to, and I think it's a really primal thing we need to be more in touch with and giving our body the opportunity to do a job that our genes expect 
it to do, mm -hmm. you know, and we don't give ourselves a chance to do that. And the impact that it can have on our ability to burn fat is just phenomenal. So we'll put that in the show notes. When we did this show on cryotherapy recently and also intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. um, this is something I do pretty much on a daily basis. Sometimes, you know, we might have a big Sunday breakfast or something, but generally, and it's not, it's not really that difficult. You know, say you get done mm -hmm. eating dinner at, you know, eight o'clock, eight the next morning is 12 hours later, you know, but I'll just push that a couple more hours to maybe I'll eat at 10 o'clock, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not that difficult, especially doing micronutrient fasting. So, you know, I might have some, uh, like Ben would probably have coffee, you know, and I might have some kind of um, caffeinated tea or something. I'm really into pu'er right now or would rooibos. Would before the 12 hours? Or yeah. After? Yeah. And this isn't because you're not bringing in Solid. calories per se, okay, gotcha. you know, so just throwing a little bit of that in there. This is really not that difficult, but you can get a lot of benefits and not mm -hmm. just for the fat loss aspect, but also for uh, neurogenesis. So like literally growing new brain cells, mm -hmm. it's just really, really cool stuff. That's made a big impact for us too at the house. Um, I mean, beyond the children, of course, but for, for my husband and I is that, that uh, waiting a while before mm -hmm. we used to graze whatever mm -hmm. was still out or left yeah <laughs> we would but we stopped that and it's made a major grazing difference. we are in fact not ruminants <laughs> you know mm -hmm. and so uh one of the things that i just want to clear up and talk about because we mentioned this both of us a couple of times so niacin that's vitamin b3 and it's in a category it's like niacin niacinamide nicotinamide nicotine mm -hmm. all right mm -hmm. so this is something that i would recommend back in the day when i was doing clinical work for people who are having issues with smoking, you know, to maybe bring in a little bit of this. And But here's the thing, caveat, guys, it causes, and I want to know your opinion on this, the flush or no flush. I think the flush niacin is the deal because you actually get the response, but it causes your skin to kind of get flushed um, by the capillaries kind of opening up, and you feel it. Like, this is one supplement you feel it. So and the it might be a little question bit. then, guys, you yeah. you're taking the there... niacin, how do you take the niacin? I take niacin in a form called inoasol, I think it's called hexa, hexasoniacinate, something like that. Um, it, it's made by a company called Thorn. It's called Niasafe. Is it a And capsule? that's a non-flushing form of iron. Less of it is metabolized by the liver. And you still get the benefits of the, uh, the enhanced lipolysis with exposure to the heat when you take that stuff. So that's what I use because I don't like that flush. So this stuff's called Naya Safe, um, and you, you should be able to find it on Amazon or you know uh, Super Supplements or whatever. But that's the one that I use. And you take that orally. Take that orally. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank yep. goodness. I mean, you I can, mean, the you way could you probably put it in an enema <laughs> and, and take it if you wanted to. <laughs> no thanks. with a lot of things, no, and, and no. I I don't completely um, stray from that. You know, I do coffee enemas every now and again, and. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but I I just take it orally. See, the, well, it's you've the way changed, you said it. You've changed our paradigm. It's the Once way you said it. We started rubbing our. <laughs> yeah, of course. There are, there are other things, orifices so we can consume to, things, yeah. you know, especially <laughs> through your skin. I'm asking now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so I mean, actually, like butyrate and probiotics, like the the short chain fatty acids that that your colon produces from butyrate, or the the probiotics that are very very beneficial to large intestine and colonic health. A lot of times, those are better taken via enema. And I mean, you can you can very easily get better absorption taking some things up the wazoo. Yeah, we anyways. could do a whole show I on bet. fecal implantation. Okay, you know about this? this I, a, I don't. And yeah, after it's this a, conversation, it's a booming field, I you bet. know. And we cannot guarantee uh, non-disaster pants. Even well. just kind of talking about niacin and and enemas and. Go Sean, ahead, you're into you're into sleep. Did you hear about the jet lag fecal implant study? Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. I sure did. Yeah. Crazy, you man. Try Crazy. It? They, they took jet lag what? people. They they took their their uh, uh their their fecal matter and injected mice with the fecal matter. Uh, mice with like a, a germ free mice who had had like a bacterial knockout, so they they weren't populated with any of their own bacteria in their gut. They injected one group with the bacteria from the jet lagged people, and another group was a control pe group. And the people who got the the uh, fecal transplant from folks who were jet lagged had a much less favorable microbiome than the people who got the transplants right. from non jet lagged humans. It actually looked so like it real. mimicked their microbiome mimicked uh, the microbiome of somebody who is clinically obese, basically. That's weird. Yeah. yeah. So just makes you want to get on an airplane, doesn't it? Get on an airplane. <laughs> no. Oh, man. Let's just leave this one alone. Yeah, we will. All right, so All right, I've got enough buzzwords coming from Ben from this entire episode. I think he said underwear 12 times. 
uh, nakedness and no shirt. I'm really trying to keep it right here on P <laughs> on point. But yeah, we could get a lot from you, Ben. Yeah, man. <laughs> I've got seven year old boys. I can't yeah, go five can't minutes. I'm talking it, right? about that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Oh man, same thing. You know, I've got a four year old son and my 15 year old son. I'm like, because I'm trying to remember when I kind of not grew out of it. I mean, stuff is still kind of funny, but I mean, my son, Jordan, like 15 year old, he is full on just like anything to do with the, f and Any you know, body like, function. especially like Eddie Murphy <laughs> jokes, like five, he, he says five, <laughs> you know, and it just, mm -hmm. it's like tears him down. Mm -hmm. Like he's crying. He thinks it's so funny. So anyways, he's man, so um, you've been uh, a, a huge icon in this field for a long time, especially what you've been able to accomplish online. And a lot of people look to you for the health and fitness information. And I just want to personally thank you for the time, effort, and energy mm. that you've put into it. Because I know what it takes to be the person who actually does the thing, you know, to experiment. And I heard that in your, in your talk today that you want to be, you can't tell somebody to do something if you haven't done it. And I really appreciate that about you. And I just appreciate all the hard, hard work that you put into to really building your brand and being able to help so many people, man. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate it. There's probably a few caveats to that. I've, I've got some female clients that I've told to do things that I haven't had to do, like go bra free, go bra free, for example, for a little bit of boob health. It's I just wonderful. go bra free 24 seven myself personally. That's how we but, uh, but yeah, for the most part. No, thanks, man. That, that, I appreciate that. I it's appreciate good. that he turned it on a dime and started moving in a different direction when he realized there was something more and pursued yeah. that. And I really drew from that that you said earlier. He shut it all down. And you sold all your stuff, and then you started to rebuild again in the new direction that we now benefit from. Yeah, it's awesome, man. And so I've got one more question for you before we wrap up, and I like to ask my guests this question, so I'm interested to hear what you have to right. say. Oh, what? <laughs> this isn't like a rapid-fire crazy <laughs> stuff, man. So what is the model that you're here to set with the way that you're living your life? Be authentic. It ties into a lot of the things that we talked about today. If you are going to to you know make health claims or fitness claims or fat loss claims, then I do think that you need to be putting your your money and your body and your activities uh, where your mouth is. You know, so you know very very simple examples. Right now, I'm I'm standing under. You know, blue light bulbs that I've installed in my office, and I, you know, I, I have clients that I'll recommend blue light boxes to, or, or these weird glasses I was showing you before our interview, Sean, that like turn out blue light. But I don't make that recommendation unless I, I go and and bathe myself in blue light and install these bulbs in my home or cold thermogenesis. I don't just tell people to do that, then fold my arms and laugh nefariously as I see people walk around shivering like I'm out there. You know, in in the in the pool, jumping in, I I follow that rule. I don't touch the hot water tap on the shower unless maybe after after it's been like a long day of snowboarding, I'll do that. But otherwise, you know, it's always cold showers. You know, or you know, the smoothie recommendation that I make. That's what I have for breakfast every single morning. So I would say, you know, I guess maybe this is a message more to the chiropractors and physical therapists and doctors and healthcare practitioners and personal trainers and nutritionists listening in is really really make sure that you're that you're being authentic that you're that you're spending time you know it, it's okay it's, it's kind of fun actually to live life you know using yourself as an n equals one a little bit of a guinea pig and um that's that's honestly a big big part of my life whether it's via instagram or facebook or twitter or my blog or podcast is just freaking uh trying stuff out and you know read not just reading research but actually doing the stuff that the research says and then uh, going out and reporting on the results to people and to me that is that's a very true form of being authentic and for me that's a it's a good model in the world of fitness yeah fantastic ben cool. can you let everybody know where they can get connected with you yeah, I've got I've got a book that's like uh it's kind of like an encyclopedia of of biohacking and you know digestion, sleep and brain and and fat loss and all this stuff. That one's called Beyond Training and that's at beyondtrainingbook.com where there's like an audible version or or physical version or a digital version, whatever you want. And then also all of my podcasts and everything are at Ben Greenfield Fitness 
dot com, or you could just Google my name and and it'd, it'd bring you there. So those are probably the two best places: beyondtrainingbook dot com and bengreenfieldfitness dot com. Awesome! Thank you so much, man. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate all the the greatness that you're putting down, man. Thank you so much. Cool. Thanks for having me on. I apologize about all the underwear talk. <laughs> no apologies necessary. If I'm anyone mad. I wanted to picture in underwear, it would be somebody like you who has made themselves <laughs> prepared you. to be seen. And the blushing starts. <laughs> little man Thank blush. You. That's right. So that's right. I'm mad that you counted the amount of times, but that's another story. So everybody, <laughs> thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope that you've got a lot of value out of this. Uh, today we talked a little bit about fat loss. We talked mm -hmm. about building muscle, you know, things that are really sexy, you know, but we also talked about the deeper stuff, which is the psychology you're bringing to the table, and also something that Ben really called out, which is congruency and being authentic. And I think that there's so much here, so much richness in this episode, and I know I got a lot of value from it, and I hope you did as well. So thank you so much for tuning into the show. Have an amazing day, and I'll talk with you soon.